Hi everyone, Dr. Marta Perez here, board certified OBGYN and MFM or high risk OB fellow. Today's episode is going to be on progesterone for prevention of preterm birth. And buckle up because there is some drama in the medical field about this. It's also an area close to my heart because I experienced preterm birth in my first pregnancy and I will tell you what I chose for myself regarding prevention of preterm birth in this pregnancy. So don't forget to hit subscribe. You don't wanna miss any episode every Friday so you can learn about pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, and let's get started. Okay, I wasn't kidding. You need to buckle up and get ready for the drama. It feels like every year for the last five years, a new big study has come out that changes the way we think about progesterone and preterm birth, and it can be really confusing for both patients and for doctors as well, honestly. So I'm gonna go over some of the background, I'm gonna go over these studies, and then at the end of the episode, I'm gonna kind of discuss with you how I try to break this down and counsel patients about it, and also what I chose for myself at the beginning of this pregnancy, which is my pregnancy after I experienced preterm birth in my last pregnancy. First, a little bit of background. Preterm birth is defined as any birth that happens before 37 weeks of pregnancy. That's considered preterm. And preterm birth is one of the most common complications of pregnancy. Preterm birth rate in the United States is about 10%, a little over 10%, and it's really either stayed stable or even had a slight uptick in the last few years. There are major racial and ethnic disparities in the preterm birth rate. In the most recent year data was available, the preterm birth rate among white women is about 9.3%. The preterm birth rate among Hispanic women was right at 10%, and the preterm birth rate among non-Hispanic black women was 14.4%. So we see major disparities there. And it's not just a socioeconomic issue underlying that, although certainly there may be some causes. But we actually see that just being a black woman in general puts you at elevated risk of preterm birth, even if you have a higher level of education and economic class than white women, you still have a higher risk of preterm birth. And this is because Preterm birth is probably a syndrome that has many, many underlying causes. And one of those causes is probably the chronic stress of structural racism that affects black parents and black birthing people in this country. And so because preterm birth has a lot of underlying causes, some of them might be environmental, things like structural racism, things like pollution. Some of them may be biologic, things like uterine malformations, short cervix, connective tissue dis disorders, infectious diseases, and some of them are a mix of both. So there are some things that make preterm birth more likely. Those things include tobacco use during pregnancy, substance use during pregnancy, a short interval pregnancy, meaning less than 18 months between your last pregnancy ending, so delivery and your next pregnancy beginning, especially if that rate is less than 12 months and especially even more if it's less than six months. So there's a lot of things that can contribute to preterm birth. The single biggest risk factor for preterm birth is history of a prior preterm birth and specifically history of a spontaneous preterm birth. So there's two types of preterm birth. One is called spontaneous preterm birth. That means your body labored or your water broke or something happened in your pregnancy that led to the preterm birth, your body going into labor or birth. There's also something called iatrogenic preterm birth. And that's basically where you have preterm birth, you deliver your baby at a preterm gestation, but we made the decision that that is actually what was safest. So an example of that is someone who develops preeclampsia with severe features and has to have their delivery before 37 weeks because their preeclampsia is so severe, staying pregnant long would be a risk to them or their fetus. And so preterm birth is indicated or atrogenic in that. When we're gonna have this discussion, we're specifically talking about spontaneous preterm birth. This data we're gonna talk about is people who are currently pregnant with one baby, not multiples, who have a history of a prior spontaneous preterm birth. That's the population that the focus of progesterone trying to decrease their recurrence of preterm birth is focused on preventing. All right, we're gonna go historically through these big studies and how they have changed our management of preterm birth. So progesterone was investigated by a series of very small studies, all different types of progesterone, all different dosages, you know, about 20 years ago. So a big trial was undergone and it was published in 2003. It's called the MEES trial. And the MEES trial was funded by the NIH and it specifically looked at does injecting, so getting a once a week intramuscular shot of progesterone, it's called 17 hydroxy progesterone caparate, does that decrease the risk of preterm birth in people who have a prior preterm birth? So the trial was a randomized control trial, meaning if you signed up to be in the trial, you were randomized to either getting a 
placebo or a progesterone shot in your arm and then you were followed throughout pregnancy. The patients didn't know which group they were in until the end of the study and they followed the patients. And what they found was a decrease in the preterm birth rate by about a third in the people who had progesterone injected compared to not. And this was a big difference. And actually because they saw this difference when they started analyzing the data at a midpoint in the study, they actually didn't even finish the study because they were like, look, this works. We can't keep this study going where other people don't get access to this therapy because we think it works. And so this was published in 2003. After that, giving once weekly intramuscular shot of progesterone became pretty much the standard of care in the United States if you had had a preterm birth in the past. And this was an off-label use. So in 2011, the FDA actually gave clearance to a company that was going to make this drug and then sell it on label for this indication. But the FDA was like, you know what, that study, it had really promising results, but it's not enough and not high enough quality data for us to be like, this is good forever. We're preliminarily going to approve it, but we need more data. And so after that there was a trial done internationally. This was called the Prolong trial. This one was not funded by the NIH. It was actually funded by the company that produced the shot. And what they found is that when they randomized people same way to an injection without progesterone or an injection with progesterone, they did not find any difference in the rate of preterm birth in the people who had progesterone versus didn't have progesterone. They found the completely opposite effect. They found that progesterone didn't help at all. What is with that? So the two big things about this trial is that there were similarities between the trials and there were differences between the trials. They both had the same history population or a population of people who were pregnant with one baby and had a history of a prior preterm birth. But there were a lot of differences between the populations and the trials as well. For example, the first trial was done in the US. It had a larger proportion of people of color in the study. It also had a larger proportion of people who used tobacco during pregnancy. The other study was done internationally and it had a higher proportion of people, almost all of them were Caucasian actually, these populations were not completely similar. There was also a really big difference between the two studies in the baseline level of preterm birth. So there was a lot more preterm birth in the MEES trial, that first one, than there was in the prolonged study. But if you have a higher percentage of something to begin with, it's easier to see a difference in numbers. But the prolonged trial was a bigger study. It was more kind of well done. And even though the populations were different, it is one that is a little bit more reliable and higher quality. So after the the prolonged trial was completed and published, an FDA advisory committee voted to recommend that intramuscular progesterone called McKenna should be taken off the market. So this threw like the OB and high risk OB world kind of in a tizzy because this had been the standard of care for almost 20 years. And suddenly we were like, it may not even work. Like we may have been giving people something that we thought worked that it actually didn't even work. That study was published in 2020. And since that time, Time, McKenna has really fallen out of favor. So then after all of that, people said, well, what about vaginal progesterone? Maybe I am progesterone, isn't it? Maybe vaginal progesterone. So there was a type of study called a meta-analysis, which instead of a study where you recruit patients and give them an intervention and then study that, a meta-analysis attempts to find the truth by combining a bunch of small studies into one big study. So they're not actually doing anything new. They're using statistics to try to make new observations from a lot of smaller studies that have less power. So this study has the eponym EPIC, E-P-P-P-I-C. And the EPIC study looked at both intramuscular progesterone and vaginal progesterone for the prevention of preterm birth. And when it collected its data in these kind of advanced statistical formats, it did find and conclude that intramuscular or intravaginal progesterone could decrease preterm birth less than 34 weeks. And there was some methodologic problems with this study, and that is they included not only patients who are pregnant with one baby and had a history of preterm birth, they also included other things that put someone at risk for preterm birth, like a known uterine anomaly. And the biggest one is a shortened cervix, which we know is kind of a whole different thing than just having a spontaneous preterm birth in the future. And it has a different set of treatments Again, I'll do another episode on that. And so really to study progesterone, you shouldn't include those populations. You shouldn't lump them all together. And so that was a big criticism of this study that it, it looked at both vaginal and IM. It said maybe they work to prevent preterm birth less than 34 weeks, but really the methodology didn't make sense because they lumped too many people together to try to study them. And then finally, just last month, another big meta-analysis, which is another study of other studies was published. This one really did limit the population 
to people pregnant with one fetus who had a history of preterm birth, and it was only looking at vaginal progesterone. And when they did their complex analyses, they basically found that vaginal progesterone did not decrease the risk of preterm birth less than 34 weeks or less than 37 weeks. Okay, so what does all this mean as an MFM doctor and as a patient myself? So first of all, as an MFM doctor, this is a complicated topic to counsel patients about. One is we think the data is higher quality that intramuscular progesterone probably doesn't work. However, I have some patients who had a history of preterm birth. They took intramuscular progesterone in another pregnancy prior to when these studies came out and they went full term and they're sitting in front of me like, well, I really, I think that made a difference for me and I still want it. In that case, I do still use it. You know, if something worked for a patient in the past, even though if we're not sure if they just carry their pregnancy full term for other reasons, or if it was the intramuscular progesterone, if they feel like it's important to them, I think it's fine. I don't think intramuscular progesterone is harmful, so I think that's fine. For other patients who have never had intramuscular progesterone or any other intervention, I counsel them about vaginal progesterone. I say, look, we don't know if using vaginal progesterone will decrease the chances of you having a recurrent preterm birth or not. We think it probably won't, but for some people who had a very early preterm birth and it was very traumatic, and so some people will choose it. Another thing that we can do and we can talk about is that we may not know why the person had a preterm birth in the past. And if we are suspicious or curious that a possible underlying cause of their preterm birth could have been a short cervix, what we can offer is screening for short cervix. So that involves getting transvaginal ultrasounds usually every other week at during the second trimester to try to see if the cervix is shortening. And if it is, the intervention that's typically recommended is a cerclage, which is placing a stitch in the cervix. Again, I'll do a whole episode about short cervix and cerclage, but that's another option for screening and management in the next pregnancy. It's a really difficult conversation to have with patients because you don't just have one therapy you recommend that works. You don't even have two therapies you recommend that works. You have one therapy that we thought used to work, but we don't think works anymore. And another therapy that we don't really think works, but we're not really sure. And so it's a really kind of difficult conversation to have with patients as a doctor, but it's also kind of difficult for patients to weigh what's right for them. And it takes a lot of shared decision-making, meaning like me giving patients information, them asking questions, and they sort of deciding together with my counseling what's gonna be best for them. All right, and the question that everyone wants to know is what did I choose for myself? I'm a high-risk OB trainee doctor. My last pregnancy, I had my son at 35 weeks and two days. So what did I choose? So I reviewed all of this data and I really didn't find progesterone to be a very convincing therapy to prevent preterm birth. So I elected to have cervical link screening. So in the second trimester, every two weeks, I had a transvaginal ultrasound to look at cervical links. All my cervical links were normal, so I didn't need intervention. And then since that ended at the middle of the second trimester at, you know, 23 weeks, I have just gone along my pregnancy trying to be you know, as healthy and as well as I can be because there's no other proven strategy to decrease preterm birth. But I think, you know, I'm a person honestly who just kind of like wants to follow the data and I, and I didn't really find the data to be convincing that any type of progesterone would help me. Now, I might have felt differently if I had spontaneously broken my water and delivered at 28 weeks. That would have maybe led me to trying to take more like every precaution if my biology had had, you know, given me a birth that was even earlier. So, you know, I can't say what I would do in a different situation really. Um, and this is what's hard about counseling patients, but it's something that I hope we have a better answer for in the future. I really think that we're not gonna make a dent preventing preterm birth until we know a lot more about what causes preterm birth and until we fix some of the socioeconomic and racial stressors in American society and help support pregnant and birthing people so much more to decrease that stress and those environmental stressors. So I hope I didn't confuse you too much. If you have a history of preterm birth, please, please, please have a consult with a high-risk OB, an MFM doctor, either prior to your next pregnancy or early in your next pregnancy so that you can decide what's right for you. Like I said, a lot of these big studies came out 2020, 2021, 2022. So I don't know what 2023 or 2025 will hold as far as research about preventing a preterm birth. So please get a consult with a maternal fetal medicine doctor. This is our specialty. I tried to give an overview of information. If you really wanna learn more about these particular studies, I'm gonna link podcasts in the show notes that are educational podcasts that are meant more for other doctors 
but if you want to listen to them to get more information, it's what I recommend. They're really well done. Um, so I'll link those in the show notes. There's also a New York Times article there about taking McKenna off the market if you want to read that. So don't forget to hit subscribe. Thank you for joining me this Friday. I hope to stay pregnant till 37 weeks and not have another preterm birth, but you'll have to subscribe and follow along to find out what happens. I will see you next week for another educational video and take care.